We've uh, got on board with us Jonathan Barat uh, joining in, the CIO at Probe Securities. And we also have on the show with us Paul Bartholomew, who's the senior MD at S&P Global Platts, joining in on the show. Gentlemen, hi, good morning. Hope all of you are trying to stay as uh, at home as much as possible and taking care. Jonathan, if I could begin the discussion with you, you know, uh, are industrial metals sort of presupposing supply bottlenecks as the economic uh, activity gets going and hence anticipating some sort of shortage in metals as and when we open up. Do you think that is what is at play? Uh, yeah, good morning. Look, I think it is. Uh, I, I generally think that we've got a, a major demand. Obviously, China is in there buying. Um, we, particularly when you look at um, uh, copper, when you look at iron ore, um, you get a sense that there is a, a supply issue due to COVID. Um, we're seeing restrictions coming out of Chile, restrictions coming out of Brazil. As a result of that, with China still buying, you're seeing this uh, little bit of a supply crunch occurring. So, so I guess while demand side there, we're not supplying enough, prices have reacted, and that's why we're seeing copper and iron all at these prices. And also we're seeing those prices being sustained. So we get a sense that prices can continue to move higher, um, you know, just purely on the supply side. When COVID changes, perhaps we'll get more confidence and it'll go up further. So at the moment, we are seeing uh, a relatively bullish picture uh, for the, uh, I guess, uh, the base metal complex as well as iron ore. Paul, hi, morning. If I could come to you as well. You know, commodities have been the best performing asset class during the rally, be it gold, be it crude, or for that matter, base metals off late. Uh, while an asset like gold rallies because of the uncertainty, which is understandable, how is it that you would explain the rally that one is seeing in industrial metals by pinning it only on Chinese demand? Yeah, as, as Jonathan sort of mentioned, there, there has, has been a few su supply issues as well that have, that have helped support prices. But uh, I mean, we, I, you know, I guess I look specifically at metals, steel, iron ore. Uh, and iron ore was $107 a tonne, I think, yesterday, which is remarkable, really. And, and it's, it's been pretty strong all through Chinese New Year and um, uh, and through the various stages of lockdown. So it's not just a sort of supply issue. It's also the fact that China is, um, you know, producing a lot of steel. Like we, our view is that China will, will produce, you know, 2% more steel this year than last year. It seems to be recovering, I think, in sort of industrial activities around about, you know, back over well over 90%. Um, there's obviously a lot of infrastructure stimulus going in that we're now see, seeing sort of uh, sort of flowing through so um china's looking okay it's really it really depends i guess on some of the other countries in asia which are still sort of coming back slowly from the uh, various uh, lockdown stages you know given what we're seeing in china do you think that's sufficient though in order to really keep those prices above 110 on iron ore steel above 500 uh, the kind of uh, push that we've seen on the construction sector there, for example, uh, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the rest of the world, which is still wondering whether they're in for a second wave. Yeah, well, we're having a second wave in Melbourne at the moment. And, that, you know, you can already see sort of how that dents things. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, there's obviously going to be some some fluctuation and, and various um, sort of volatility. Sometimes this time of year is a bit of a weaker month in China due to um Due to wet uh, wet weather and everything, but uh, I think I think you know, there's going to be some you know weak sectors that are going to affect a, a lot of different countries, like manufacturing, for example. That was already in the doldrums before the the virus hit, really. So, you know, I see that uh, particularly impacting some of the more export focused countries like Japan and in Europe, possibly Germany. Uh, so I think you know there's still going to be some some sort of fundamental weakness in in those areas. Um, and I think also in exports, obviously, India has been trying to export a lot of steel. The, the, the Indian uh, companies that you, you showed uh, at the beginning, there, they're, they're lifting back their capacity utilization again. But I think, you know, it's a bit of a challenge if you're going to rely a lot on exports because everybody's doing the same thing. It's that that create, creates, uh, you know, price pressure. Um, so, you know, I, I guess in an ideal world, everybody could rely a bit more on their own domestic economy, but obviously they're sort of coming back slowly and the confidence aspect, I think, is going to take a long time, uh, you know, to, to come back before people feel safe to go out and buy cars and washing machines again. True. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, how would you read into the rally that we've seen on the Baltic Tri Index, um, implications that would have on iron ore costing, subsequently, uh, you know, on uh, steel pricing as well? It's always good to see a good bounce, there's no doubt about it. Uh, that actually gives us a little bit of confidence that international trade's occurring. 
um, you know, when you see that demand. So, so I think it's an encouraging picture. Um, I, I guess one of the key things that we're all thinking about is the sustainability. You know, sustainability of those uh, freighting rates. Um, you know, to see whether they will continue, and also the sustainability of those economies to recover. Um, I, we've always discussed about this uh, this uh, V-shaped or the U-shaped recovery, a V-shaped recovery in confidence, um, yet a U-shaped recovery in terms of uh, economic performance. And and we still think that that we've got to be cautious uh, about a lot of this because um, you know we've got these second waves coming through, and uh, obviously we're feeling the pinch. You know, in Australia at the moment, and uh, and whether that sort of reverberates through other economies is something there. But but I guess at the moment we've got to run with the confidence that we're going that we have. We've got to make sure that you know that that, that rates will continue to move high because that is a, that is a very confident thing. Um, you know, and that demand is there. The demand stays there. Um, you know, on one side we can see that 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 you know we're we're seeing economic performance occurring, but we're also seeing people very cautious because people are moving, you know, into gold as a safe haven because we're seeing such a dramatic rally there. So so it's good to say that we're doing things, but people on the other side are saying, well, what happens if? And and that's why we've seen this sort of this interesting thing about base metals, you know, moving higher and then all of a sudden gold also moving higher. Um, you know, is, is that, that disconnect that people are still still widely concerned, you know, of, of a second wave and how that really will affect the economies further down the track. Jonathan, uh, gold is considered to be a safe haven, but some would say <clears throat> that that is 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 25 <clears throat> years ago when the <laughs> options to store and conserve something digitally was not available. So do you think somewhere mm. we must recognize that gold which was considered to be a safe haven was considered to be a safe haven because digitally you were not able to save and store a lot of things which you can now. So as a result the appeal for gold for a long term investor will go down. Look, 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 I mean I think whichever way you look at it, I mean there are, the, the market where, where you're, uh, there are people who are always bearish gold, right? Um, you know, and there are people that are bullish gold, and obviously the, the bullish gold people like myself, um, you know, are, are confident the prices look good. Um, but you also got to look at when we, we look at the demand for gold, physical gold, perhaps from, from an Indian point of view, the wealth that has been created through record prices within the within India and the stability that creates within the economy because everyone has some gold somewhere. And when you see record prices, um, you know, paid for gold at the moment, it's, it's, it's reinforcing that sense of stability the people that are actually seeing the metal. And I think that that's carrying through quite nicely, um, you know, where we're seeing spot prices move higher. So so I guess as a store of value, you know, people are starting to recognise it because they're actually seeing prices move higher and, and at record prices. So they're saying, well, this isn't a bad investment, plus it's a, it's a store of stability with my own economic, my own home economics, because I own gold. Um, you know, and I think that that's played out very well and very dramatically in India, who 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 are you know the the world's greatest um, hoarders of gold. It creates that stability, you know, and that sense of confidence that if anything happens, they they have their holdings. So yes, I think there is this play at the moment, which which we're running with that seeing gold higher. Paul, I'll throw two perhaps uh, contradictory points at you. One. The real demand for metals, which also has been a function of India's GDP growth and China's GDP growth for the decade gone by, which was north of 5 to 6 percent on an average. That will come down drastically. That's the bearish side. The bullish side, Paul, is that dollar index is speaking out. If the dollar index moves down, historically it has acted as an indicator for money moving back into risk, which includes metal. That's pure price action, not in demand action. What do you think? within the bullish and the bearish argument which I just articulated, Paul, deserves a greater degree of attention. Yeah, well, I suppose from, I guess from um, the perspective I'm looking at the market, it's, it's sort of less from an in investor perspective. But um, I, you know, I think in, as far as sort of China is concerned, and obviously that's the uh, the big, the big uh, consumer of mo most of these um uh, metals that you know, I, I think the, the fundamentals are, are very, very solid. Um, so we we've sort of looked at both uh, just recently looked at sort of the outlook for steel, alumina, uh, aluminium, iron ore. We we do this sort of Q3 outlook, calendar Q3 outlook, and it's it's all very sort of uh, very very upbeat um, because you know capacity is sort of coming back on. Uh, uh, aluminium, aluminium smelters are being sort of turned back on. 
so the alumina demand sort of picking up. So, uh, and as I say, you know, steel's on track to to be more than above a billion tons uh, this year, uh, which is why you've seen a big jump in in iron ore prices because it doesn't take much of a uh, a sort of supply sort of flashpoint like we've sort of had in Brazil, for example, to suddenly find that, uh, you know, iron ore prices are, uh, are pretty strong again because China's producing sort of more in its capacity across many, many different metals. Is, it's actually been sort of lifted, uh, you know, more than, well, at least earlier than some people uh, expected. So I think, I, I guess I'm sort of looking more at the the fundamentals uh, from an investor perspective, probably Jonathan's better place to answer. But, um, you know, I think from from that sense, it's you know it's 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 pretty solid, and as I guess all the other countries like India and Southeast regions like Southeast Asia switch back on, um, that's that's only going to sort of help uh, you know support uh, demand. Okay, Paul, Jonathan, gentlemen, uh, great to have you on the show and get in perspective on what's really going on with commodities.